Well, folks, it's good to see you. It's uh, 1030, so we try to start right on time here if we can. And I uh, just want to say thanks for being with us today. And uh, we always begin, uh, we're going to greet our guests in a moment, but we begin with prayer first. And uh, so we want to uh, start with uh, and thank the Lord for this day. This is the day the Lord hath made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. Now, we left all the chairs here from last week, and so it's, it's getting a little farce out there. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> sometimes uh, I appreciate all the crowd that came last week, but I appreciate you folks that are here every week. Amen. So uh, God bless you, each and every one of you there. And so my dear friend, Brother Keith, is here. Keith, God bless you. Keith is the plumber that jackhammered up a big hole right here in the center, got down in there, fixed that deal, and uh, I mean, saved the church a tremendous amount of uh, money and uh, got that done. And uh, his son Isaiah and uh, uh, Jackson, I believe, I, I was teasing him. I called him Andrew Jackson all the time. So, But, uh, <laughs> well, thank you. It's good to see you guys there. So let's go to the Lord right now. Father, once more we, we stop here and just say thank you. Lord, sometimes it, that doesn't say enough. There's. We should do more than just thank you. We should serve you. We should worship you. We should look to you because there's none other beside you. Lord, many religions have many different gods, but there's just one true God. And we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us through your son, Jesus, and the dear, sweet Holy Spirit. Fill us, use us today, do a work here that when we walk out today, we can say only God could do that. God, that's what we want. We want to see you at work. Bless the music, bless the preaching, the teaching of your word. Thank you for all the teachers that have already taught. Thank you for all the folks that are here. Thank you for what you will do, Lord. In your holy name we pray, amen. amen. Well, amen. let me just quickly mention, if you're a guest, thanks for coming. Well, if you don't mind filling out that little card that says, let's get acquainted, throw that in the, uh, uh, the big chest back there. We'd appreciate that. Um, and so God bless you. We're grateful that you are here today. So guests, remain seated. Church family, right now, would you go ahead and stand? And uh, that way we'll kind of know who's guest, who's not. We want to say thank you for coming. God bless you. And uh, then we'll all stand when we start singing. All right. It's wonderful to see everyone this morning. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to, to our wonderful church. The Lord is very good, and it is good to be here. Amen. 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 I'm Travis Odom. I am excited to bring you the announcements for this morning. I do have quite a few, but they're exciting. First off, I want to wish a, a very happy birthday to Ms. Uh, Jane Ellen. Happy birthday to you, ma'am. You bet. Lovely lady. Lovely lady. Uh, we have a lot of wonderful things happening right now. First off is the men's prayer time. Okay, I bring it up every Sunday because it's extremely important. I'm excited to be a part of it. 9 a.m., Monday mornings. If you're a fella, if you love the Lord, and if you can be here, please come. It's a wonderful time to bow our heads together and go to the throne of the Lord in the name of Jesus and just talk about our families, talk about our church, talk about our young people, talk about our country for crying out Amen. loud. Amen. And it is good. It is very good to get that, that week started right. Uh, this Wednesday night at 6.30, we have our, our adult Bible study. Brother Dan is bringing once again out of the book of Daniel. It's the second one, chapter 2. So powerful, so wonderful to see. Uh, we will have that as well as youth events at 6.30. And of course, our Awanus program for the kiddos is happening at that time. Um, 
choir practice will be right after that at 8 p.m. So please come be a part of that. And if you, if you, could, if you would like to be a part of the choir, we'd love to have you. Amen. There aren't a lot of us over here, and a couple of us can't even sing, okay? <laughs> I'll tell you right now, I'm the one. I'm over here just making a noise so I can be a part of something I know is good, but believe me, don't give me a microphone, okay? Either way, please come join us if you can. We'd love to have you lift up these, really they're prayers. We sing these songs, but what we're doing is we're praying out loud Amen. to our Lord and ushering in his presence so that he will speak boldly through our servant as the word goes out. Amen. And it's just Amen. a ministry. It's a wonderful one. Uh, we do have a really cool youth event coming up I'm excited about. We're going to Frontier City. It's called Ride for Christ, a gathering of Christian people. There's going to be a concert. There's going to be roller coasters, of course. And it's a good time to gather together and edify each other as young people in the Lord. We're doing that on April 21st. It's right after church on a Sunday. And we're going to leave from the church at 3.30, uh, proceeding in company to the, to the event there. It'll go on till 7.30. It's going to be a lot of fun. If you have any questions, come see me. Come see my wife, Kristen. Go see her, actually. She's the one with all the information. But no, just come see us, and we'll get you in the right place. We have the mother-daughter banquet coming up. Uh, please come, sign up. Uh, it's our annual banquet. It will be May 10th, that's a Friday, at 6.30 p.m. Uh, there is a theme, it's a country and western theme. It's called Happy Trails to You. It's gonna be a lot of fun. You don't necessarily have to be a mother or a daughter to participate, just come and join us. It's gonna be a wonderful time. The best part though, is the talent event. If you have any talent whatsoever, even if it's not that good, we'd love to see it, okay? Whether you're singing, whether you're dancing, whether you can play the piano, whether you can do some sort of interpretive dance to how great thou art, like my dad does, okay? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. He was, he's going to stump me for that one. But either way, it's just a lot of fun to get together and praise the Lord together. And then we do have a special thing this, uh, this week I'm going to bring up. Um, it's, it's a little tough to talk about, but it's important, okay? I don't know if any of you in this room have ever lost loved ones. I'm sure you have. If you've ever been through it, all right? If the Lord has ever allowed pain or any sadness to come in your life, I know we can all expect it or we've been through it ourselves. There's grief in that, and there's a time of healing, and there's a time of growing in the Lord even through that pain. And there is a group that meets at this church, okay, and they help each other get through these situations, all right? Uh, it's a grief share, and we want to invite all of you who could be going through anything or if you know anyone who's going through any difficult time to attend our Christ-centered 13-week program, okay? What it is, it's a grief-sharing program that's designed to help you heal because there is healing even in the most horrible losses that you've experienced. There is a way to glorify the Lord even more through that situation. It's designed to help you heal. Now, the cool thing about it is, even if you don't make it to the first one, you can start attending at any time during the process. You can pick it right up. It's just a lot of wonderful, warm hearts for Christ, helping and growing together in these things. Uh, it's a public event, so you don't necessarily have to be a member of the church to come. If you know anyone at work or in your circles that is going through something, bring them, you know, just for them, even if they're not a member. And, uh, and if you're not gonna come, at least pray. Okay, lift them up. Lift up what they're doing. It's difficult to do, and please be with them uh, at the throne of the Lord in the name of Jesus for that. Uh, many have experienced considerable healing from this event already, and we're excited to go for it again. Okay, uh, I don't have a day. I don't have a time quite yet. Once it's established, I'll let you know about that in the weeks to come. All right? And last but not least, I'm excited to share with you about our home our home evangelism Bible study groups. We're gonna start very soon, okay, to be, de to be determined on a day and time. But what it is, I like to call it activating your faith. All right, Christian? All right, believer? It's about going out in your life. It's about going to Walmart. It's about going to the gym. It's about going wherever you go and inviting people to your home to your very own home or a home of a friend of yours. You have a little meal, you have a little Bible study, and man, those are important, but the most important part is the invitation, okay? I'll give you more about that as it develops, but we're gonna start that very soon. Get ready to get involved, all right? All right, I'm gonna pass this on over. We're gonna have the offering, I think. Is that right, sir? Wait a minute, uh, men's breakfast. Oh, we do have a men's oh, breakfast. Yes. There I go again. 
This Saturday, 8 a.m., men's breakfast, right there at the top. All right, men, come on a Saturday at 8 a.m. It's going to yeah. be wonderful. Amen. Pastor. Amen. I yeah. don't have anyone to uh, teach the uh, men's breakfast, this, so I'm doing it, and I'm going to do something that I did year, a few years back, and people, men have asked me to do it again. And I'm going to bring a teaching this Saturday, men, and I hope you'll come and bring someone with you on how to protect your family from the powers of Satan, how to put protection around them. There are biblical ways to do that. And I'm going to teach that, explain it, and give you some diagrams, a lot of materials to help you with that. That's this uh, 8 o'clock. It's a great time of fellowship, the meal, etc. And then we will do that. I want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving. God bless you, each and every one. I appreciate all the folks that give from uh, YouTube also. We appreciate that. And... Um, we are going to be starting soon, All everyone on YouTube, if you get our church app, which um, it should be on our website, uh, we've got it right here, that, that uh, code, you can uh, download that, and uh, that, that's our church app. You will be able to get all my notes before you even hear me preach on, on Sunday morning. You already have the notes in, your, in the uh, Chisholm Creek uh, church app, et cetera. And so, uh, and folks, you can do the same. That same code is out there in the foyer on a little stand, a little thing there. So, uh, what do they call that? A Q thing or something? I forgot what. A, <laughs> a quick response, QR code, that's it, yeah. So, QR code. So, uh, you know, I'm really a high tech, folks. I mean, I really, uh, uh, I, it's am amazing I can even walk. So, um, but, but praise the Lord. God bless you, um, but today we take the offering. We ask you to give as God bless you, and the way we do it here, if you're new, uh, you can put in as God has blessed your tithe, your offering, and if you have a need for food, clothes, shelter, we ask you to feel free to take. So put in, take out, but whatever you do, honor the Lord. You can put it in the plate, or you can put it in the big chest as you leave. God bless you. Father, thank you for this offering. We give you thanks now in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Brother Bryant. And uh, praise the Lord from whom all blessings flow. Take your Bibles, please. And today we return to the book of Genesis. Um, someone told me this last week that we've been in Genesis now for a year and a half. Well, hang on. We're, it'll make two years by the time we finish. And so, because uh, we're... We're getting close. I mean, today's chapter 41. We're going to chapter 50. But, um, and today uh, I thought seriously about dividing this actually in three parts, this one chapter. And then I thought, oh, no, I can't do that. I'll just do it in two parts. And I said, nope, can't do that either. Because the continuity of this story have, you have to see the whole chapter, really, in, in total, to really grab hold of it there. So I am going to omit uh, expositing on about seven verses. That's from verses 17 through 24, because Pharaoh's going to repeat his dream like he had done just prior. Uh, so um, I'm just going to go over that dream once. But I'm going to skip those verses because he's repeating it for Joseph. So we're, I'm not going to do that since it is a repeat. It's there for a reason, don't get me wrong, but I'm going to, um, uh, uh, so I still have 50 verses to look at this morning. And he said, well, will we ever get to go home today? Maybe tomorrow? Uh, no, no, I, I, that's why I, we need to get with the program here. And uh, all I need for you to do is, you know, I try to stop when God's done, amen. I, I just don't need, don't need any more preaching when God gets through talking, all right? So but as long as the Lord's got something to say, let's hear it, amen? But you are in for a blessing. Hang on to your bonnets, ladies. And, um, and you uh, guys with toupees, hang on to those because um, you're in for a real blessing today. So um, I... Your notes say one thing. I've added a little more to the title. I, I, here's what I think the title should, I should have written down. I do those notes on Thursday, and I, sometimes I upgrade it quite a bit. <laughs> and so it goes, from riches to rags to, uh, from rags to riches, God's way. That's what I want. So it goes from riches to rags, yeah, from being a man with a multicolored coat to riches. Then he goes from, from that, from riches, uh, uh, he's going to go back to rags, and uh, then he's going to go to riches again. So uh, we're going to see how God's going to work this whole thing out. <clears throat> uh, Joseph's rise to power. And so um, uh, let's go ahead and look at this very first verse in, I think, that will help us to uh, get, get, the, um, get the feel. I call it Pharaoh's dream. And God is working in deep things inside of Joseph all during this time. So um, here we go, verse one. Then it came to pass. Now most people would just move right on. No, 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 don't, don't do that. Everything's in there for a then it came to pass. It's one of the most blessed verses of the Bible. Folks, it didn't come to stay. It came to pass. Amen? And that's why Joseph's going to find out. I don't know what you're going through today, but thank God it didn't come to stay. Amen? It came to pass. So I, I love that the way it starts right there. Here we go. Um, at the end of two full years. Well, when did that full two full years start? Well, when he, um, remember the um, uh, butler and the baker, the butler, the cup bearer, and the baker, uh, he d does their dreams for him. It's been two years. He asked the, the um, uh, cup bearer to remember him when he gets to, I mean, of course, the guy has amnesia or something and forgets for two years to it's convenient for him to remember. He's going to remember today, but it's, you're going to see why he remembers. Then it's, <clears throat> at the end of two and two full years, that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river. 
Now, there's only one river, and that's the Nile River. That's 1,647 miles long. Suddenly, there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then, behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, and they were ugly and gaunt, emaciated, if you will, all right? and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and the gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking cow, looking and fat cows. So Pharaoh awoke. That woke him up. But because cows was one of their gods. Remember, they, the children of Israel made a golden what? Calf, because it was a god of who? Egypt, all right? And so... Um, <clears throat> so that they, they love cows, and it was a big part of their economy. Verse 5, he slept, and he dreamed a second time, and suddenly seven heads of grain, here's the second part of it, and came up on one stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed, it was a dream. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men, and Pharaoh told them his dreams. But there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. So first of all, he has this dream about this cow, and, um, and you know, and, and they're in the river, now, they usually go in the river because of a couple of things. The heat, the cows are go into that Nile River because of the heat. Also, the flies are terrible in that part of the world, uh, insects, etc. And they go up to their neck, and they like eating the reeds, too. That's the, they, they do that. So, uh, now, the Nile River, like I mentioned to you, is the longest river in the world, 1,647 miles long. I didn't measure it. That's what I read. And so uh, it starts from equatorial Africa all the way down through Egypt to the Mediterranean. And when it hits the Mediterranean, it fans out and makes into a delta. And that delta brings in not only water where they irrigate from it through different channels, but also it brings in silt like uh, manure or um, maybe I should have used that word in church who knows uh, uh, but you know what I'm talking about uh, fertilizer is what I'm trying to say and so uh, it's like a fertilizer and it, that's why anytime there is famine most people go to Egypt like Abraham etc because they always had food but they're, go they're not going to have some pretty soon so we're going to see that but that's the Nile River, and they worship the river, the, the Nile River. That's why God turned it to blood. I don't have time to get into that. But, but uh, so we see that. So the cows, they feed there. So come, being in the river, coming out of the river, is nothing new for Pharaoh. But having these emaciated, uh, ugly, skinny cows eat up the big fat ones, that's kind of weirdo. And you've had weird dreams. But, boy, this woke him up, got his full attention. And so, um, so we see seven fat cows, seven lean, and then they get eaten up. Then we see the, uh, goes right, he goes back to sleep, and he has a one uh, almost very similar, except this time it's with grain. And the Bible tells us in verse 6, there was an east wind. Now, that's very common in uh, Egypt and in that part of Africa, uh, North Africa, and the Arabian Peninsula, which makes up uh, uh, Egypt, the east wind, it's, it's, if I can pronounce it correct, uh, it is the calm scene, the calm scene. They have a little of it in Israel occasionally. Uh, the calm scene, it comes in uh, late winter or spring, and when this wind comes in, it'll last for two, three, or sometimes four days. It will raise the temperature 40 to 50 degrees like that. And it will wilt the plants. So that's what most uh, commentators believe. This is what he's talking about, the east wind, this calm scene. 
um, and we were in a kibbutz in Israel one year, and I got out, and uh, that we were staying in a, they had a motel there for tourists, and so we got out, and I thought, man, what's happened? It was kind of a uh, weird um, yellow fog everywhere, bugs everywhere. It was hot, sultry, and uh, they said, oh, that's the Kamsin. I said, uh, what's that? <laughs> so uh, it made me think about that. So I, I've actually seen a little of it years ago when uh, we were there um, in the springtime. But, uh, but let me continue on here. So we, the, this grain withers, and Pharaoh's dream, you know, he wakes up. Now, why is this so upsetting him? Because this is what makes his economy. Cows and agriculture. And now he's had a dream they're both going to pot. And he can't figure that out. He's trying to go, what in the world is going on? And so he's very disturbed about it there. And you know, they, the god of Egypt, one of their main gods or goddesses is Isis. And Isis is the goddess of agriculture and fertility. So you can get that there. Uh, uh, they, <clears throat> so like I said, they worship cows, etc. That's where we get the whole ISIS is where we get the concept of Mother Earth. You ever heard anybody use about Mother Earth? That comes from ISIS worship. Uh, so, so just like God put Joseph in slavery, and he put him in prison to prepare him, to get him ready. Uh, you know, it's so important. Uh, I... I um, I forgot to mention something. I like A.W. Tozer. He's one of my favorite guys. What God is doing with, why did he put him in prison? What's going on? God's working deeply in Joseph's life. I'll just say, I'm going to quote Tozer to you. He said, and I quote, it is doubtfully, <clears throat> excuse me, it is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply unquote and i would have to agree that you know uh god may hurt you but he will not harm you my dad hurt me numerous occasions when i definitely deserved it but he never did harm me amen there's a difference there and god will do that there and that's what he's done for joseph if he left Joseph uh, uh, with his many-colored coat where he, and the sleeves went over his hands, which means he didn't have to work and everything, he's out there spying on his brother, he would just be a pampered, spoiled brat. But God said, no, 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 I'm going to put you where I can train you. For 13 years, he was either a, he was thrown in a pit, he was th sold into slavery, he was lied about, and the most of us, probably 10 to 12 years in prison. But wherever he was, he made the best of it. And he kept going, you know, kept moving forward. Now he's 30 years old. He's no longer 17. He's 30, as we're going to see at the end of our text today. But uh, uh, God has a plan, an overall plan, a chain reaction he gives Pharaoh this weird, disturbing dreams. Um, and uh, just think about this. If he hadn't been, Joseph has a dream, tells that he has two dreams about the uh, sheaves and about the stars bowing down to him and et cetera. And so uh, his, his brothers, just they just freak out. They, they throw him in a pit. They're planning on killing him, but then they decide to sell him. And so they sell him, and, and so off he goes. And you know the story. He just keeps going down, 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 down. And uh, <clears throat> it was a chain reaction. It's like I was going to set up, and I forgot to bring them from home. If I could find them, our dominoes. You know, have you ever set up dominoes? You push one over, <coughs> they all go down. Well, God began the domino effect there in his life for the next 13 years. Boy, I was going to set up 13 dominoes. Boom, 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 boom. God is doing something inside him. He's getting him ready to rule the world. And so not to be a spoiled brat, 
And so, uh, but you see, if he hadn't gone, uh, been sold into, uh, to the Ishmaelites, and the Ishmaelites sell him to Potiphar, and Potiphar's wife, you know, she's, she lies about him, he ends up in prison, then he wouldn't have ever got to tell those two guys the interpretation of their dream, and uh, one of them gets, you know, hung and all that, but the, uh, the other guy gets, uh, just like he said, in three days, he was back doing his job again, and he has amnesia for two years now. He just freaks out, but then uh, we're going to see at the right time. You see how God used all that? But God was also preparing. The, he was working both sides. He was getting Joseph ready, amen? So uh, when, he, when Joseph comes into the court of Pharaoh, uh, God is going to do something great. And that's the overall master plan of God. Not only to prepare his man for the way, but also to get the people ready. Because ultimately what's going to happen, this famine's going to come and his brother's going to come. You're going to see that next week. Oh, it's going to be what goes around comes around. But they're going to have to come looking for food. And they don't recognize him. He looks like Tammy Faye Baker. You know, and he's all bald and everything. So uh, here he is. But praise God. What a man he is. But uh, so uh, what's going to happen? The, they're going to bring their families there. And ultimately, Joseph dies, and they're going to be made slaves. And for 400 years, God's going to put all those people in prison themselves and get them ready to do what? To take the Passover, the Seder, put the lamb in them and leave and go out. And 40 more, uh, 40 more years of lapping the desert, you know, ultimately he's going to get them ready through the prophet, through his man Moses to take them into the promised land. Do you see the master plan God's got running here? Oh, I, I, I could go on and on and on. Don't have time. But boy, what a master. Only God can figure this stuff out. When you say, it doesn't make sense to me. Hallelujah, you're in good company. Let God handle it. Amen? You know, uh, God's going to send them back to Canaan and he's going to teach them to repent and they're going to get their land back and even today God is still breaking those people getting them ready for the Messiah's coming. Amen? So, um, uh, and, and guess who subsidized the whole thing? I like God's economy. God's interested in economy. He is. I believe in tithing and giving. I believe in God's economy because it blesses us. But the Egyptians subsidized this whole deal because Pharaoh said, take, take the spoils with you. Yeah. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, Paul wanted to go to Rome. He kept telling him, I'm coming to you. I'm going to come to Rome. And one day he appeals after being in, in prison for two years there at Caesarea. I, I appeal, you find it in Acts 25, I appeal to Caesar. And he said, to Festus says to Caesar, you shall go. And guess who paid for that entire trip? Rome, amen. He didn't have to raise any, uh, you know, support or anything, no. <laughs> no, uh, so um, it, it, it's amazing. Now, notice here the magicians, they can't interpret. I mean, they're useless. And here's what gets me. They don't even try. They don't cook something up because they know if it's wrong, it's curtains for them. So they don't even try. You know, uh, the... Uh, Interpreting of dreams in Egyptian days was very big. It was a science. They, you, we see all kinds of hieroglyphics today and, and uh, materials about that. Let me go on to the point two. Notice how God takes Joseph from riches to rags, then from rags back to riches. Here we go. Verse 9. Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh, saying, Oh, yeah, I forgot. It's been two years now, two full years. I remember my faults this day. <laughs> no, he just, it's convenient now for him to remember this. Because Pharaoh's freaking out. He wants to find somebody who can know how to interpret these dreams. 
When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me into custody of the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker, remember that, that Pharaoh? We each had a dream in one night, and he and I, each of us, dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now, there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the uh, guard. And we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us to each man. He interpreted according to his own dream. And it came to pass, just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. You know, three days, the, uh, <laughs> the uh, beggar, you're going to get killed. He's going to hang you. He restored me back to my office, and he hanged the other guy, exactly like what this young Hebrew guy said. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly. Anytime the Pharaoh says, and he's upset too, so these, they're getting out of the dungeon, and notice what he does first. He shaved. He changed his clothes, and then he came to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it, but I have heard it said that you can understand a dream to interpret it. Now, he's been in prison now for 10, 12 years. He's been a slave prior to that. He wakes up in his cell that morning, probably he said, well, another day in the dungeon. He had no idea before this day's out, you will be the second most powerful man in the entire world. <laughs> oh, from riches back to rags, or rags back now to riches. Now we see what he's going to do. Verse 14, he shaved. Well, why, why does the Bible even... We all shave, Pastor Dan. No, we don't. No, we don't. No. Now, all what we've learned from archaeology, and this proves the Bible to be absolutely correct, what I love about it is that there was only one people in the entire region there that did this. It was not the Israelites. They didn't shave. Joseph hadn't shaved. It's not the Midianites. It's not the uh, Canaanites. It's not the Hittites. It was just the Egyptians. They were the only one. Why did they shave? They feared lice. They feared it. They not only shaved their head and shaved their whiskers, which I did this morning in honor of Joseph. Amen. I got I used to keep stubble on, but no, I, it came off. And, and so, um, but they shaved their whole body. So, I mean, so he's a cue ball, you know. Boom. There you go. There you have it. All you guys that are no hair, which I'm getting there pretty quick myself, uh, that's okay, you know, um, <laughs> that's, uh, uh, y y you know what, uh, there you have it, uh, Pharaoh, Yul Brenner did look like Pharaoh, didn't he, amen, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, okay, but, uh, uh, <clears throat> but, or Pharaoh looks like Yul Brenner, I guess, maybe I should say that, but he interprets these dreams here. Now, n I left out verse 16 out of your notes, and I could kick myself for doing that. But notice what verse 16 says. So Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. He, he tells, I, I had these dreams. I hear you can do it. Let's, let's hear it. And so he said, It's not in me. I can't do it. Now, probably years earlier, he might have said, well, sure, I'll, I'll see what I can do. Now he recognized, no. There's a tenacity about Joseph. He's before the most powerful human being in the world. But it doesn't bother him. Be, I can't do it. Sorry. You want to? I know it's not me doing it. It's God. God's the only one that can do this. And he said, I happen to work for him, so I'm happy to help you with that. So Pharaoh repeats the dream. And I'm going to skip verses 17 through 24 because it's just a repetition of what we just finished reading. But I'm going to pick up in verse 25 to save us time. 
Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. They are in parallel. They are the same. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. God has shown you what he's going to do, not you or me or anybody else. The seven good cows, those are seven years, and seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one, and the seven thin and ugly cows which you came up after the seven, uh, after them are seven years, and the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind that come seen are seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt. But after then, seven years of famine will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. And the famine will, be, will deplete the land. So the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following, for it will be very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because of what? Don't miss this. The thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Hmm. Two dreams that meant the same thing. They were in parallel. Joseph sees himself and his brothers binding sheaves. He's got, he had a dream with two parallels, remember? <laughs> he sure did. In fact, there are three pairs of dreams here that we see in this story. We see with, him, with Joseph when he was a young man with the um, uh, sheaves bowing down to him and the 11 stars bowing down. Two. Then we see the, the cupbearer and the baker. They have two dreams, and he interprets those. Now here is Pharaoh with two dreams, and he says they are one, and he is about to. Now, is, what's that all about? I got up at 1 o'clock this morning because I couldn't turn my brain off thinking about that. And here's what I think. God gave it to me about 3 o'clock, and I went back to bed. So, <laughs> so praise God. It took a while, but I got it. I'm not sure if I got it, but I think I got it. But here it goes. We know if you study the, the works of numerology in the Bible, you know the Bible is full of numbers. Three is the number of what? God, deity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Two and the mouth of two witnesses shall I think be established. That's uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. And you see it right here in our text, too. So you've got God speaking the truth to Pharaoh. And we see all three of those. To me, I just, to me it's quite interesting. Maybe it's, well, Pastor Dan, who cares? Well, I, I think I, I do. I want to know. But, but let's go on here. Um, so it's three sets of two dreams. It's God and his witness. God and two. Three and two. God and witness. But number two, it said, it's not me. It's the Lord doing it, Joseph said. It's not in me. God will give you the answer. It's not me. Oh, aren't you glad? Boy, uh, I, that's, the way, that's the way to live your life. Not me, it's God. Amen? Joseph doesn't blame others. <laughs> you don't see one, you don't see him all upset here, do you? He has been a slave and a, uh, he's been gone since he was 17. Now he's 30 years old. He has gone through, uh, in, uh, thir you know, all the mess he has gone through. It's unbelievable. I don't have time to go over all that. I can just hear him. How about if he if he'd said this? You know, Pharaoh, look, I would have been here a lot earlier to help you, but my freaked out brothers uh, threw me in the pit, and they were going to kill me, but uh, thank God these guys bought me, and then they sold me to Potiphar, and boy, what a weirdo he was 
and his wife, whoa, don't get me started there. She's the original Mr. Ro Mrs. Robinson, you know. Uh, um, and so, uh, and, the, and Potiphar, he was kind of a creep too. I don't know what to say here. And, and don't get me started about all this other stuff. And then this idiot cupbearer, he doesn't have, he, he has amnesia for two years. Give me a break. But you don't see any of that, do you? Because God's broken this man. And he recognized God's got a plan. And I'm part of that plan. The man and the plan are going together. Amen? So, here's the key, and please remember this. It's not original with me, but please remember it. If you kneel before God, you can stand before anyone. If you kneel before God, young people, you can stand before anyone. Amen. Joseph is a whole lot more concerned about what God's got to say than anything he's got. Joseph is not intimidated by the power and the prestige of the Egyptian pharaoh whatsoever. He might look like an Egyptian, but he's God's man on the inside. Amen? Amen. Notice that tenacity that he has. The same that John the Baptist had before Herod. The same that Paul had between Felix and Agrippa. The same that Elijah before King uh, Ahab and Queen Isabel. You know, interesting enough, uh, I'm not patting myself on the back. Not at all, please. But a year ago, I mean four years ago, the COVID thing was going, remember? We, we had Easter church in the parking lot, remember? Uh, I had gotten permission from the governor to preach in the parking lot and do all that. And uh, the week before Easter, I got a phone call from the associational office, the associational missionary, he's, he's retired now and gone. But he called and he said, I got a call from the mayor's office. And uh, there's only three churches that are doing what you're doing. And all three of you are going to be arrested this week if you keep doing it because the mayor's made a, an ordinance that you can't do that. Oh, you can go down to the liquor store anytime you want and park wherever you want and go in there. But you can't have church. I said, I don't know about the other pastors that are doing what I'm doing. I don't care. That's between them and God. But I said, I'll just pack a bag. Because next to Jesus, Paul's my favorite guy. And he spent half his life in prison or jail. So no problem. I'll, I'll just uh, have a bag packed. He said, I'm not kidding. I said, I'm not either. Amen. Well, a few days go by. I get another phone call from the same guy. He said, the mayor himself called me and said, you are definitely going. The other two have already said they're not doing it. You're the only one left. I said, well, I can't help that. We're going to keep preaching the gospel no matter what. If they want to come in on this land, which they don't put one dime into, and arrest me for preaching the gospel to a parking lot of people on Easter Sunday, come right on. Brother Keith was here when that happened. His son, there was a van that pulled in and had an emblem on the side and it looked just like an Oklahoma City van. And so he thought it was a van full of police officers. They pull in and he comes running down. Isaiah, his son, comes running down the, the uh, uh, ramp here. Pastor Dan, they're coming to get you. They're coming to get you. I said, great, go get my bag. It's in my car. I've got it packed, ready to roll. Got plenty of tracks, my Bible, we're ready. And it was an African-American church because everybody was shut down. They picked up these folks, brought them here so they could see me. I was doing a narrative sermon as the Roman centurion. I'm out there in a dress, that's all a fun. <laughs> Go out there in a dress with the wind blowing, you know? Yeah. But you know, we had some people saved that day. 
A man got saved from Bethany. It drove over here, and God changed his heart. And they never came and got me. But guess who's been invited to go see the mayor on Tuesday morning this week? Have a picture with him. Show me around and pray in front of the whole council. It's me. That's what I'll do Tuesday morning. I'm not going to bring any of this up. <laughs> because I, don't, I want to try to be at least a little like, like Joseph. You know? But uh, I am going to pack a bag, though, just in case. You never know what will happen. <laughs> but you know, folks, you can pray the gospel. You can watch me on TV. I'm going to pray the gospel out. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm just saying in my small little way, I can see some of this happening. But uh, Joseph's advice, let's notice this here, verse 33. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the, in the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store it up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Then the food shall be a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt that the land may not perish during the famine. That was his advice and that was good management. Amen. Now, don't get the idea that he's trying to sell himself for a job. He's just doing what God's telling him to do. So he's saying, hey, you know, I'm a foreigner. I'm a, a prisoner. I'm just up here, just shaved and came up here uh, for, for this deal here. Let me just say this. Faithful employees seek what's best for their employer. They always do. He's faithful and little. If you are, God said, I'll give you much, Luke 16. Now, the last point, and I've got to move on. Pharaoh set Joseph over all of Egypt, verse 37 through 57. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all of his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this? A man in who is the, notice, the spirit. Of God. Now, this is a pagan lost Pharaoh. But he's wise enough to say, We ain't gonna find one of these guys just anywhere. He's been through the fire. God's prepared him. And Pharaoh recognizes he's different than anybody else. How about you? How about me? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and as wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all, all the land of Egypt. Now notice what Pharaoh's going to do. He took his, not, he didn't have one made, he took his own signet ring off, his own hand. And he put it on Joseph's hand. That word signet means to sink in. As they would have wax or clay and they would sink it in. It's more than a, a, a gold uh, American Express card. It's a whole lot more than that. He could do anything he wants. He can move things. He could do, I mean, he, he's in charge. And he puts that on his hand. And he clothed him. Hey, he's getting a new set of clothes. He got, he got his prison clothes off. They put, gave him some more clothes. He showered and shaved all over. And then that, now he's getting another set of clothes this is fine linen. And he's getting a little, young people, I've learned this word, a little bling. 
Aren't you impressed that your pastor knows? I have no idea what bling is. Whoever, that's crazy. But, uh, but he's got some bling going, gets him a gold chain, amen? Hallelujah, around his neck. And he had, had him ride, he's getting him his own wheels too, amen? Oh, he's got a chariot It's not like any other chariot. It's a special chariot. In fact, you know, I'm, I'm hoping I can dive down and look at those chariots over there in the Red Sea soon. And they found one with 12 spokes. They believe that's Pharaoh's. That's chariot number one. He probably had a 12-spoker too because it was number two. Uh, he, he was on number two chariot. And so... Uh, uh, so and they put fine garment. They put um, Joseph's. I'm losing track here. There's one discerning as wise as you shall be, regard the throne of greater in the land of each. Okay, uh, his signet ring. Put in Joseph's hand and clothed him with garments, fine linen. Put a gold chain around his neck. Verse 43. And he had, had him ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried out before him, bow the knee. I wonder if Potiphar's wife was out there bowing that knee. Interesting, isn't that so? So he sent him all over the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, Joseph, no man may lift his hand or foot in all of the land of Egypt. You're in absolute control. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name. This is a great name. Zephniath, or Zephniath, Paneath, which means Savior of the world. From a prison to the Savior of the world. You know, uh, I preached on Jesus and Joseph a while back, and I made this point too, I have to make it again. I love it when they do have, after seven years, they, you know, we're going to read about it in just a moment. Oh, hallelujah. Here comes the kings, the princes from all over the world, and they're bowing down to Pharaoh saying, we, we need food, we need, because you see, they had such bumper crops, they had to quit counting them, there's so much. So 20% of that, no telling how much that was. They didn't even have numbers for it, it was so much. Well... They said, I can't help you. Food, that means you want life. Uh, that's, I've turned that all over to, to that guy over there. You go to that rejected Jew who has become the savior of the world. What does that remind you of? I don't need to say any more. And it gave him a wife, Azaneth, the daughter of Potiphar. Actually, it was his stepdaughter. Guess who her mother was? I don't have time to go into it, but I read it all from Biblical Archaeological Review. Her mother is Dinah. She is the product of Dinah and Shechem's uh, uh, rape and... She, this uh, priest of On, he adopted her when he heard her crying. Amazing. So, uh, so Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now in the seven plentiful years the ground brought forth, so he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities. He laid up in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them. Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting, for it was, you could not measure it. There was so much of it. So 20% of that was able to feed the world. Amen. And so, and to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came. 
whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar's priest of On, bore to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. Oh, I'm going to tell you what these boys' names mean in a moment. I'm going to say that for right now. For God, um, God has made me forget that, that well, I've already, yeah, that's his name. All, all, all my toil in all my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful. Actually, it means double fruitfulness in the land of my affliction. In verse 53, then the seven years of plenty which were in the land of Egypt ended, and the seven years of famine began to come as Joseph just had said. Well, how God had said, amen? And the famine was in all the lands, not just there, all the world, which means Canaan, and all the lands of Egypt were uh, there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, go to Sapiath Paneah, the savior of the world. Whatever he says to you, do it. The famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. And the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. So all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all lands. Don't you dare miss next week because it's going to get very interesting about his brothers. They're going to show up too. Now, I want to give you some things that will help you understand this a little bit. There's uh, the term high, I'm going to spell it for you because it's an Egyptian word, H-Y-K-S-O-S, linking the high kasas to the Israelites in Egypt. I got this from Biblical Archaeological Review and uh, fairly recently, high kas, this because see, liberals try to say this couldn't have happened it's impossible you can't get people that low a prisoner to be this high that fast it just doesn't happen okay i'd beg to differ with you sorry dr dry buckets or dr fluffy head um but um but it did happen and we found it in their records in the egyptian records um the high cost entered an Egyptian along with the somatic, somatic groups talking about Jewish people from Canaan managed to rule over Egypt from around 1670 to 1550 BC. He was called the Great Mouth because he was such a great spokesman and the greatest, wisest leader they ever had in Egypt, period. That's from the Egyptians. Amen? A Jew, a Semitic, came and did that at the same time that Joseph was living. Amen? I always just liked for Dr. Fluffy had to read these things. Uh, kind of helps me, but, uh, but thank God. Uh, and let me also, uh, I mean, you know, uh, I've already told you about Dinah, but uh, I want you to, from 100 uh, B.C., in the summer of 2022, just recently, fairly recent, Biblical Archaeological Reviews, Professor Dr. Patricia Arbena Cole of the University of Minnesota, she's a Christian and she's an outstanding uh, archaeologist, uh, analyzed this text in uh, Asenath of Egypt. And she not only talks about the Dinah thing that I talked to you about, but she delves into the development of Asenath's character from the Egyptian daughter to Jewish matriarch. Now, what about that? Here's what she writes and what they have found in hieroglyphics and in the writings of the Egyptians. She said, quote, this is from Biblical Archaeological Review, romantic story of Joseph and Asenath's courtship. Initially, Asenath rejects Joseph, but then falls in love with him only to have Joseph reject her because she is the daughter of an Egyptian priest. It's only after she repents and changes her allegiance to Israel's God that Joseph marries her. And that's why you see he stayed married to one woman, not a, not a, a, a harem, one woman, and to her the rest of his life that we have history of. And he had two kids, one named Manasseh, which means forget about it. That's what it means. 
My friend, when you've been sold into slavery, lied about, put in prison for most of your adult life at that point, he's saying, God has taught me to forget about it. Forget about it. Put it into the sea of God's forgetfulness. I don't know what's bugging you. Forget about it. Manasseh, we get the, the root word, which is where we get our word amnesia from. Forget about it. And then be double fruitful, Ephraim. Double fruitful. You can be fruitful, but you can't be fruitful as long as you are carrying that stuff around with you. Amen? Uh, Dr. Henry Morris, he has a great, he is a scientist, theologian. He's with the Lord now. I know his son very well. Dr. John Morris, he's the founder of the Institute of Creation Research, said in his book called The Genesis Record, quote, the necessity of Joseph's long period of suffering and humiliation is now clearly seen. Any other man so suddenly exalted would certainly be filled with heavy pride and sooner or later would have been ruined by his own success. Joseph, however, was properly tempered, made mellowed, after years of slavery and imprisonment had taught him humility such that he directed all the praise to God alone. Thus he was insulated from the kind of pride that would have ruined most men. The Bible says that God has the king's heart within Proverbs, I think it's Proverbs 21, the king's heart, and he moves it just like a river however he chooses. Amen. Philippians 3, 13, 14, Brethren, I do not count myself to apprehended, but Paul says this one thing, one thing I do. Forgetting. Manasseh. Forget about it. Those things which are behind. This one thing I do, he says, and reaching towards those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal and the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Joseph had no pettiness or bitterness. Let, folks, here's what I'm going to end with. Let God handle those Potiphar's wives in your life. Those people who accuse you falsely. Let God handle all the cupbearers who forget you. If you want to handle it, God will let you. But you'd be foolish to do it. Yeah, if you want to handle it, God said, be my guest. See how you do, Maxwell. <laughs> I already tried it. I tell you what, I want God to handle it. Let God handle people who wrong you. Forget about it and be fruitful for God. Romans 8, 28, and I'm done. It's one of my favorite verses. But then I'm going to, I'm going to add verse 29. So, oh, no, that's got the, uh, you know, predestination verse in it. <laughs> I tell you what, don't be afraid of anything the Bible. You're missing the point if you freak out over that. Romans 8, 28 and 29, Paul writes to Rome, and we know, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to do what? To be conformed into his image. God is conforming us. Amen. Amen. It might be a little tight sometimes. That's all right. Oh, he'll let you handle it. He said, well, I'll handle it, God. He'll let you try. When you mess it up big time, he said, let me have it now. Why don't you just let him have it right now? Forget about it. Forget about your people who have bugged you and hurt you and done, done you wrong. And start being fruitful for God. Would you bow with me, please? You may not understand everything I've taught on today. But thank God 
for the Bible. Thank God for Joseph. Thank God. I wanted to go through all these verses because you need to see the whole story at once to really grab hold of it. And maybe God is speaking to you to say, hey, you're in training right now. God has still got you in prison in some way. He's got you under some issues some way. That's all right. That's okay. And the people that have messed with you and hurt you and done you wrong, forget about it. And let God take it from there. Be fruitful. We're to have the fruits of the Spirit of God. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patient. That's the fruit God wants you to have. Maybe today you say, Pastor, I'm not really sure if I die to go to heaven. Well, my friend, you need to make sure before you leave. I'm not trying to get you to join this church. I'm not trying to get you to be a Baptist or a Methodist or anything else. I want you to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And right now, would you just pray in your heart, just say, Dear God, I understand I'm a sinner, and I need you more than another breath of air. And I ask you, be my Lord, be my Master, be my God. Save my soul, Lord. Thank you for doing that. And maybe there's others here if you're a Christian already, but you have been hanging on to stuff and you've been letting the past control you. Forget about it. Forget about it. Forget about it. And begin to be fruitful. You can't untangle the past. Let God Take care of that for you. And be fruitful. The fruit of the Spirit. Today, you say, I want to, if you prayed that prayer to receive Christ, I'll meet you here at the front. Would you come when we stand to our feet and let me pray with you? We'll give you some materials. You don't have to join anything, give anything. No, no, no. No, we just want to help you. Maybe you say, I, I, we want to be a part of this fellowship. You want to be a part of a church that holds up the Bible and is unashamed. Then do that. Whatever God's telling you to do, do it. You just want to come to the altar and pray. You can do that. Absolutely. Do what God tells you to do. Father, I thank you for this message. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you, God, for these sweet people. May they hear not from Pastor Dan, but from you. By your Holy Spirit, oh God. And may we be different because we were here today and heard a living word from a living God. Thank you, God. In your holy name we pray. As we stand, I'll meet you right here at the front. Mom, dad, teenager, as we're standing, you be coming. <laughs>